Hello, everyone. It's Michael Shermer. It's time for another episode of The Michael Shermer Show. I am your host. As you may recall, I am the publisher of this Skeptic Magazine. This is my day job. The Skeptic Society is a 501c3 nonprofit science education organization, and you can uh, donate to that at skeptic.com slash donate, which supports the podcast, the magazine, my skeptic column, and so on and so forth. Here's our latest issue on economic matters. Here's one on nationalism matters including Christian nationalism, and that may come up in today's conversation. Uh, anyway, I appreciate your support and uh, introduce my guest today. I've been long looking forward to this conversation. Tanya Marie Lerman is the Albert Ray Lang Professor at Stanford University, where she teaches anthropology and psychology. Her books include When God Talks Back, Understanding the American Evangelical Relationship with God. She's written for the New York Times, and her work has been featured in The New Yorker and other magazines, and she lives in Stanford. Here's the book we're under discussion today that I just finished, How God Becomes Real, Kindling the Presence of Invisible Others. We will discuss what that term means, kindling, but uh, Tanya, nice to see you. Thanks for coming on. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having <laughs> me. So what is an anthropologist of religion or a psychologist of religion? What, what is that for, for the uninitiated? That's a great question. So an anthropologist is somebody who does her work by usually by field work. That means that somebody like me, I go someplace I want to understand. I spend months or years hanging out in that place, deep hanging out. I immerse myself when I'm studying church. I, you know, go, go to church services. I go to Bible studies. I have coffee with people. I go to conferences. And then I try to describe what I've seen. An anthropologist with a foot in, foot in psychology does the same thing, except I add to my participant observation skill set the method of experiments. I use. I also use surveys. I interview many different kinds of people. I begin to look at numbers to see, you know, whether everybody has these experiences and what kind of people and what do we know about these people. Um, I've d done that. I, I decided I became fascinated by these experiences, and so I ended up trying to understand who, what kind of people, what kind of practices in this culture, and then I started going to other cultures to seeing whether, you know, those observations had legs someplace else. Mm. That's what I do. Yeah, I like that. I think most people think of anthropologists as someone like Margaret Meadens and Borneo and <clears throat> or uh, Napoleon Chagnon with the Anamamo yeah. or um, Ma Malinowski with the Trobrian Islanders. And you went to American evangelical churches <laughs> yes. as your subject. I find that incredibly interesting. Uh, so before we get to the How God Becomes Real, just tell us a little bit about the previous book and your experiences of going into those churches in the sense of what were the people like, uh, you know, they really believed to, to what extent they sort of believe and it's more of a social thing or, you know, how do so you think about I that? I think that's such a good question. What is it that people are doing when they say that they believe? So I um, actually, so I should say I spent a lot of time in these evangelical churches and this was a kind of a what, what you might call a charismatic evangelical church. This is like a quarter of our all of our countrymen, something like that, 20%, 30%. These are people who seek are who are Christian and they seek, they understand that Christ is willing to have an intimate relationship with them, intimate, kind of like a friend, and they expect to feel God's presence. In these kinds of churches, in this kind of day and age, Jesus and God are pretty interchangeable because we tend to, these tend to be, ah, this is just sort of a terrible way to frame it, but these are buyer's churches. These are churches that reached out to Americans after the great cultural changes in the 60s in the assumption that America, too many Americans were becoming secular, so they were making an understanding of God to bring people into the church. And in this kind of understanding of God, God tends to be pretty terrific. Great big, this is too crude, but a great big teddy bear in the sky. People don't talk about hell and damnation. They don't talk about Satan. 
it's not that those concepts are absent and there's plenty of talk about demons here and there, but this is basically God imagined as the perfect human other, as like what your mom was, but better than your mom, what your dad could have been, if your dad could have been like that, all rolled into one and always available. And the promise in a church like this is that if you go there, you will start to feel that this God is real and that he responds. I thought that was amazing. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and then you would distinguish, let's just have different bins of different kinds of believers. So the evangelical believer who hears the voice of God, maybe they're just hearing their inner voice like we all have versus the Pentecostal person who's writhing on the floor and speaking in tongues. They're having a different kind of experience. Um, well, <laughs> so, um, so let's talk about the difference between belief and experience. Belief is, you know, you, you could get a lot of psychological and philosophical chatter about what, what we mean by the term yeah. belief. But yeah. basically, we're talking about a sentence, a proposition. I believe in God. My own point of view, and I have research in multiple countries that supports this, is that the commitment, I believe in God, is always a little different from the commitment that, that when I walk on the floor, I'm not going to fall through. There's a bunch of stuff in the everyday world that we take sort of take for granted that we believe in, but we treat it quite differently. So no one, even a devout, committed believers, nobody asks God to feed their dog. Nobody asks God to write their term paper, right? So there's this deep commitment, but there's always this kind of, we would got the, this commitment is kind of special. And that's something that is really clear for all believers. So even if somebody tells you that their, 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 their grandma in Minnesota, well, she really believed that grandmother is likely to have said, I don't believe enough. So the dilemma for any devout Christian of any stripe or dilemma for the devout Jew or the devout Muslim or the devout Hindu is that, you know, you're trying to experience God and you're trying to really believe in God and you feel that you're at the kitchen sink, you're washing the dishes, you've forgotten that Jesus matters. So that's just, that's just an existential dilemma for any any believing person, I think. Okay. Spiritual experience. People have, humans have vivid sensory experiences of things that are not sensorially present. So all of us, you know, some of us more than others, probably some cultures more than others, all of us there are people among us, regardless of our belief commitments, we have funky experiences. So people hear voices on the edge of sleep and they see things that they didn't think are there. Sometimes they have a flash of white light. They wake up from a dream and it's like amazingly compelling and it doesn't feel like it's their dream. And you can, with different practices, you can generate more stuff. And in different kinds of churches, you generate different kinds of stuff. So Pentecostals, famously, they speak in tongues. And tongues is this generation of phonemes. Uh, so somebody once taught me how to speak in tongues, and you could do it. You know, your, your, your gentle listeners can do this. You know, you say, she should have bought a, a hun, hun, Hyundai. She should have bought a Hyundai fast. She should have bought a Hyundai. 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 Sounds like speaking in tongues. Now, people can just do that, and you see them doing it in church. And when they do it and they get into it, it becomes a whole big deal. And they can fall on the floor, and they can writhe, and they can feel like they're not moving their own body, that God is moving their tongue. And so one of the things I do as an anthropologist is to, is to say, well, how many objects are there? What kinds, like, are there, are we talking about 
20 objects that people can cultivate and sometimes have them spontaneously and sometimes cultivate? Are there really two objects? Are there Anyway, that's the kind of thing I, I fret about. And I think that those experiences are really important because for the person who's trying to experience God or to try to know God is present, and they don't, you know, God is hard. God is invisible. And there's always this kind of, I can't quite believe enough. If you feel God touch you on the shoulder, if you want to believe in God and you feel God touch you on the shoulder or you hear God speak to you, it can be fantastically wonderful. And so those experiences can, in some churches, are really sought after. And that was the case in these churches I spent time in. Mm, interesting. Okay, I got a funny story for you. So I'm listening to your book on audio, where you're talking about people having these anomalous, you know, whatever they are, hearing voices or whatever. So this was last Monday. So I always drive down to Chapman. I go down the coast from Santa Barbara here where I live. Uh, and I park at Neptune's Net. And I go for a couple hour bike ride. So I'm riding along on my bike up PCH with the earbuds in, listening to you talk about people hearing these voices. And all of a sudden I hear some voices behind me. I went, whoa. And I turn around and there's four cyclists, like pros. And they come up on me. So I hop on. Oh, okay. It was just the cyclist. So then we ride for a while and I'm just drafting them and trying to hang on. Anyway, then they're going to go for a couple more hours. I got to turn around and go back to my car. So I get back on the road and like five minutes later, I hear the voices again. I thought, oh, I guess they must have changed their mind. They're coming back. So that's good. I can just draft them back to my car. No, there was nobody there. And I'm like, what? What? <laughs> and you're still talking about hearing voices. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. so, so this can happen so, to anybody. It happens to anyone. It's kind of an effect of talking to me. People are more likely to have these experiences. Um, I just remember talking about this it's when I arrived at Stanford at some dinner event and somebody came after up to me afterwards and said, oh, my God. I heard a voice. <laughs> so it happens. <laughs> and it also teaches you that these, these, you know, there's the story of the event, and then there's a the story of how you understand it, and there's a relationship. So how you understand, so there's, you know, what, what do we know about the events? What do we know about how the way you understand it, or the way you search for it, or the way you want it, how does that affect the experience? Um, there's this whole ball of wax about its relationship to madness, because that's another deep puzzle. These are these are deep puzzles. You know, when they're not, like I've discovered these puzzles. These are the puzzles that, you know, the medieval clerics had to figure out, right? Somebody comes in, I've says, God has told me to do this. And the question is, well, do we believe that? Did they really have the experience? Are they what's that about? Are they, are they crazy? Okay. Let's say they're not crazy. Well, let's say it's a real supernatural experience. Okay. Then what kind of experience? Good God or, de or demon? I mean, it, it's, it, it's, it's a deep issue. So someone like me does, that doesn't believe, I just kind of blow it off as an interesting, weird anomaly and, and then have a fun story about it. But to the believer, maybe it's the same event and they interpret it. Well, God is, you know, sending me a little message or whatever. It could be anything, right? I got the parking spot, I turned left instead of right, and this wonderful thing happened, and that was God's way of whatever, communicating with me. Uh, and it could be the same causal uh, vector at work there. So someone like Oliver Sacks may say, well, Shermer, your auditory networks were lighting up for some anomalous reason, and, and that's, that's all it was. And maybe the believer would say, yeah, yeah, but it was God at that moment that triggered the auditory for a reason, right? It happens for a reason. Uh, like the stuff on witchcraft um, at the uh, with the Azande. They know that, that there are natural events that are not caused by witches and so on, but it's the timing that it, you know, that the roof collapsed at that moment when I wasn't there, that was the supernatural element, not the collapse itself that has a physical cause. Yeah. So people who start to hear God speak to them um, are often, in my experience, pretty sophisticated. They have a sense that there is a God in some, however we understand this, outside, or maybe inside but not themselves. God is not who they are. There's something different. And that God, however they understand God, 
It has a mind, has agency, has intention, and so that God is communicating. So they also know that as they search for God, there's a lot of them involved in the process. So, you know, one of my favorite stories is actually, you know, uh, people... You know, so people in these churches, they know that people can fool themselves. And one of my favorite stories is being in one of these churches. And there's this woman up at the front of the church. And, you know, she has decided that God has called her to do missionary work in Puerto Vallarta. And if the church really believes this, they should fork over $10,000 and send her on her way. Perfectly reasonable thing for her to be doing. Um, but you can ask the question, is it God or her? Anyway, so the guy, a guy listening to this, standing next to me, leaned over and said, boy, God sure wants a lot of missionary work done in Puerto Vallarta. <laughs> right. I want so, to go to Hawaii. So, and God told me. <laughs> yeah. So there's, there, there is that. People tend to be pretty sophisticated about that. And there tends to be a way of talking that you can support with psychological experiment and testing that says that you come into a church like this and you come to, you can come to experience a more vivid, a more autonomous, um, a more real relationship with this invisible being um, with whom you're interacting. And so I came to know people who would go for walks with God and would sit on a park bench with God and would have dinner with God. And they would, you know, they'd they'd have a beer with God. They'd have a cup of coffee with God. And when I talk to them about what's going on, they know perfectly well that part of this story is them. And then the other question is like, how much of the story is God? And so there is a lot of of the Azande there. You know, God tells me something when I need it. And so the the Christian is thinking, okay, well, this, do I need to hear this now? There's a lot of judgment about what's been communicated. Um, And there's a lot of doubt. And so the pastors, the sophisticated, mature pastor, Obviously, there are less sophisticated and mature pastors. Obviously, a lot of nutty stuff happened around the election. But the mature pastor will say, as is something I heard a pastor say in New York, if God tells you to quit your job and move to Los Angeles, I want you to be praying with me and praying with your prayer group. If God is telling you to relax, that's fine. That's God. (laughs) Right. So, you know, like, yeah. yeah, but then you get these sort of, you know, Abraham and Isaac, you would say that that would be a hard call. You know, Kierkegaard says that that moment when Abraham's willing to, to slit his firstborn son's throat, that's the real commitment to God. That's what it takes to be a person of faith. You know, and, and people sometimes do pop up in the news. John Krakauer wrote a book about Mormon, a Mormon mm-hmm. man who did something heaven. like that. Yeah, one of the great um, books. I love that book. Yeah. But, you know, most people don't do that. Uh, most people, in my experience, uh, people are more likely to say, okay, that moment when God told me when I was 10 years old and my parents were getting divorced and I didn't know how this could happen and God spoke to me and said, I love you and this will be okay. And so, I, and this was a man who was telling me the stories and he, a devout Christian for, for decades. And he said, that moment, I knew that was God. Everything else, well, I don't know. Right. Right. I'm reminded of uh, George Carlin's line, you, um, you know, tell people there's an invisible man in the sky that invented the universe and knows we're here. Uh, and they'll believe you. Tell them that the paint is wet and they have to touch it. <laughs> so, and they won't. <laughs> so there's like a a, a a reality realm and a mythic realm or, you know, empirical right. truths and 
religious right. truths, and they're different. They're they're right. treated differently. It has nothing to do with how educated or intelligent someone is. They're just treated in different realms. Right. And if you're lucky, that mythic realm can be incredibly useful. So it's I you know. I used to think of this when I was, uh, I'm, sometimes I have a rough time sleeping and I remember like being at this church and waking up at three in the morning and, you know, telling myself to calm down and go back to sleep, not don't fret about this. And I remember, remember having the thought, gee, if Jesus could show up at the foot of the bed, I bet that would work. And I think, you know, that's true. That sense of, if you were lucky to choose the right kind of guide, and some churches and some books will help you to do that, and you are and you are able to persuade yourself that that inner guide is actually outside of you, it's more effective as a way to break your habits, behave differently, be more confident. It's, it can be a quite a useful tool. Yeah. One reason I wanted to have you on the show is because I just had uh, Ben on the show. Oh, he and, is so wonderful. Uh, yeah, he, he highly recommended you. His book is Presence, The Strange Science and True Stories of the Unseen Other. So we got to talking about sleep paralysis and all that. Really extreme anomaly, anomalous experiences. Uh, but, but I had sent him this letter, and I sent you this letter. I'm going to read the letter so our readers uh, know what we're talking about here. Uh, from a, a reader of mine named Taylor. Uh, who it just introduces, I'm a fan, and so forth. I grew up Christian, but I've come to really question most of the worldview I grew up with as I have learned more about critical thinking, cognitive biases, science, history, etc. However, I'm still very much a part of the Christian community since my entire family is still Christian. An issue that comes up often that I would love to hear your input on is the idea that God speaks to people individually and regularly. Also, that God gives prophetic words to people today about future events. I sincerely doubt this myself. I would love to hear your thoughts on this topic, especially after reading the latest issue of Skeptic on Christian nationalism. As I'm sure you're aware, many Christian leaders claim to hear from God that Trump was going to win in the 2020 election when he didn't. Very few of them admitted that they were wrong or mistaken. This is just one example of a very pervasive problem in Christian culture. Most people base important life decisions, even insurrections, on their perceptions or those of their leaders of God's personal revelation to them. This can come in the form of an impression a confident feeling, a still small voice, a personal interpretation of a cherry-picked Bible verse, a picture in their mind, unique ex circumstances, etc. Do you have any past articles or guests and so on and so forth? So yeah. give us your thoughts on what okay. would you tell Taylor? So that would be me. That's what I've been studying for the last yep. 15 years. Um, and part of what I would say is that the story... Either there's a story to tell when people commit to some kind of belief and they really commit to it publicly and it fails. The best book on that is When Prophecy Fails. There was a you know, community of sociologists who discovered this woman who'd announced that the, the world was going to end on like December 21st. And, you know, they followed her and she was basically happy go lucky. But they really, a lot of people made many, many preparations. And when that failed, when December 21st, 22nd came around, that's when they began to proselytize, like they were desperately trying to hold on to the truth of that commitment. So there's something special about certain commitments that are specific enough um, that are costly to your identity. And if they go wrong, you want to preserve your identity. So a lot of these weird, often when I see the claims from some Christians that I think that they, you know, if they were just ordinary claims, they wouldn't have trouble with things like, you know, gun control or, or you know, guns or, or um, COVID masking or uh, the election denial, denial or climate change. Some of these ideas got wrapped up as parts of their identity, not as happy-go-lucky things they might know about the world. And when it gets wrapped up as their identity, people behave differently and often, you know, pretty irrationally. Okay, there's another story to tell about how people come to hear from God. 
And one of the things I can say is that I, I think that there, the way you can come to one of those churches and you learn to hear God speaking to you, it's a skill. You develop it over time. But you begin by looking for thoughts that sort of stand out in your mind and that feel more spontaneous than other thoughts or louder than other thoughts. You're also... You, you, the Christ, that you, the naive Christian, are also looking for thoughts that sound like the kinds of things that God might say, and so there's this kind of search process. And as people pay attention, they are hoping that the some of these thoughts feel not me, and they are um, looking for some not me thoughts, and they get better at identifying them. So, you know, you get, if you're, like often people learn this process through through praying for other people, that's often where it begins. So, you know, Anna is up at the top of the uh, front of the church and she's praying for Cordelia. She, Anna's got her hand on her shoulder. Anna believes, expects that God will give her a stream of, of images and words, which Anna, the person praying, is going to speak out loud for Cordelia, the person who needs prayer. And of course, we're assuming, everybody assumes that Cordelia is in need. Otherwise, she wouldn't be at the front of the church asking for prayer. Maybe Cordelia has said what she needs pray, prayer for, maybe not. And then Anna might be told, as you, you were in the church where I was spending time, Never prophesy about birth, death, or marriage. It just upsets people too much, and you can be wrong. And so, you know, Anna is getting this stream of images, and so she's starting to throw them out. I see an orange butterfly, like a monarch butterfly, and it's so beautiful, and it's lighting on a flower, and it's telling me that God is coming to you. And Cordelia is or is not responding to these. And there will be a couple of these images that really will p capture Cordelia's expectation, yeah, and, yeah, her, her emotion. So Anna is generating these words. Cordelia is responding to a couple of them. Sometimes that happens. When that happens in a remarkable way, Anna is transformed. So I remember somebody telling me the story you know, at this church, you're not supposed to pray about, you know, birth, death, you know, marriage. And this woman comes in, she's new to the church. This other woman is, you know, she's part of the prayer team. She comes over to this woman, she puts her hand on her shoulders, begins to pray, doesn't know what she's praying for. And this young Christian keeps seeing the picture of a baby. And she's feel and she's new on the prayer team. She's very embarrassed about this. She's not to, supposed to mention the baby. But finally, she says, I see a baby coming into your life. Woman goes away. Young Christian feels terrible about this. And then it becomes an important milestone in her life because, of course, or not of course, but the story is that this other woman she prayed for came back to the church. She was pregnant. It was an amazing moment for the two of them. And this new young Christian felt, oh, oh, right. It really works. And so there's more trust in the fluency of the image. And people are really looking for things that stand out, you know, and in the domain of having God speak to you as, you know, whether you're using the tarot or having a conversation with someone in your mind, you know, the person who's doing the asking is walking down a certain path. And there is this emotional experience of coming to terms, this moment of peace. You turn over a tarot card and I was like, oh, that's what I should do. Or, you know, you're even like, I'm, I'm thinking about what I'm going to say to my class. I can be walking to, to, to school and I can, I, I'm like, blah, 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 and there's this moment of peace. That's what I should do. That's human, and it's also religious. So the person who is doing this with God is increased. So there are two things that happen. First of all, they develop that, that ability to have the relaxed, yes, that's what I should do. It's also true 
This is, I find this in my work. People tell me that this is true, and I think it's true, that the mental experience of the person who's having these experiences changes. So they have that, that's at, at least some of their mental images start to feel sharper and deeper and more kind of not me. And so there are probably lots of pieces of this. Like when, when you go into an intense daydream, you know, the more intense it is, the more it's not you and sort of the better that it gets. Well, that's a skill. That's part of the package of you know, engaging in something imaginative. And, and these these groups can use that kind of thing. My favorite example of this recently, and I hope this is engaging and rather than horrifying your listeners, but there are people who call tulpamancers. Have you heard of this term? So, so tulpa, T-U-L-P-A, it's uh, the name for, since in theory, the name for an invisible spirit in the Tibetan texts. And you can be more or less committed to how deeply this idea is embedded in the Tibetan text. You could say this is like deity, yoga. You could say that it's... Like an angel. So it's like an angel. You could, so the idea of the Tulpa kind of... You can pull it out of these texts, and I'm guessing the different Tibetan scholars would have different views about whether the idea is really present. So there is um, this adventuresome woman who wrote about traveling to Tibet in the 30s. And she wrote about discovering mental, this mental practice in which you create a tulpa. And in three pages, she says, yes, I created one. He followed me around for a couple of days and maybe weeks. And then I got rid of him and, and, and I had to work hard to get rid of him. Anyway, so there are these really interesting often young men, not always young men, who decided to do this. Like 2000, around 2011, the group of them got together. They started reading this book book. They started reading other books. They created a website. They had lots of training manuals. They had zero metaphysical commitments, right? They did not, they were your kind of people. They would, you know, they, you know, they, they, they absolutely were opposed to the idea that this was supernatural and they laid out practices and there were two big practices. One, you do what the Ignatian spiritual exercises ask you to do, but you don't call it God. You, you imagine what you want your invisible friend to be like. You, you, sit there and in your mind's eye, you just create that invisible friend. You see the eyelashes, you see the ears, you see the tail, if it's a fox, you see, you know, you see the outline, maybe you sketch the friend, maybe you, you know, you spend, yeah, maybe not 20,000 hours, maybe not 10,000 hours, maybe, maybe a month for three hours a day. You know, it, people vary. And the other thing that you do is that you just begin to talk to that tulpa as if your friend is there. You just start narrating your day. And people are pretty clear that um, within something like, it varies, some period of time, some people say very quickly, other people say three months, they start to feel that this pretend invisible friend who they don't believe in as a supernatural presence, they start to feel that this being is autonomous and talks back. And they start, and, they, and most of them, so I was working with a young postdoctoral fellow, Michael Lifshitz, and we brought him out and we scanned their brains and we're still trying to figure out what we found, what we found, but we talked with them for about four hours a piece and most of them, you know, quite intellectually capable young people, um, very creative, pretty, you know, they liked books. And they, they, um, they had a lot of time on their hands. And they all talked about a kind of a sequence of autonomy. Like there was the moment when you knew that the, that the invisible friend was real. 
that something autonomous happened. You hadn't decided what your friend was going to say. Some of them reported a moment when the friend spoke out loud. Some of them reported a moment when the friend pushed them. And so th there is something really skill-like here. It, it, you know, some of those tall, some of those folks do end up with the idea that they're they've created something sentient. Hmm. Interesting. So those beings are real in the heads of those people that believe in them, even though I don't believe they're real. So maybe, so here I've been trying to refine my thinking on different kinds of truths, and and uh, you know the old my old just typical scientific atheist person would say, well that's all bullshit. You know there there is no God. There's no one listening. These people are just making this stuff up. Petitionary prayer doesn't work. You know the example you gave. Uh, well, but what about all the people that were prayed for and they weren't? They didn't get pregnant or the cancer patients who died, uh, you, you know, and so on. And why doesn't God grow, amputee new limbs? You know, that kind of thing. But maybe that's missing the point. Is it that you're in church, you have people who care about you, people that love you, that you have a social support system, and there they are verbally expressing support for you, and that feels good. And that's got to have some positive effect on oh, one's yeah. well-being and health and so on. So in a kind of a pragmatic William James sort of truth, it is true because it works. It changes yeah. people's lives. Is that how you would characterize this? I, I think so. But I, I would add to that that if you could pull off a useful God, you're pulling off an inner coach. So these are skills that help you develop the sense of an invisible other who interacts with you. A lot of those skills are human. Um, with the Telpomancer community, the Telpas are almost always, in the words of the human, more effective than they, than they are, wiser than they are. Tell them not to eat that ice cream and to reach for the sparkling water instead. Um, there's an, And so there's this, I do think there is this deep, human capacity to have a kind of an inner attachment to a, um, again, to an inner coach, to, to a being that you kind of create. Now, if you are lucky and you are in a church that enables, like the, the modern churches, um, apart from the craziness about the election, are often um, kind of lovely. In that they they you know you spend a lot of time in Bible study, refining and making sure that this God concept is a kind and loving God concept. When it goes wrong, it's awful. So if you happen to be a person in one of these churches, where you're you're really making this 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 God who you know you're consulting to all the time, it's basically becomes another name for your conscience. It makes all decisions for you. You feel completely loved, it's completely inside you, and you discover that you can't do sex the way your church wants you to do sex, and you're, you hit 18 and that's not going to work for you. That's a horrible experience. I mean, that's truly terrible. Um, and so there's this whole world of people who do what they call deconversion and deconstruction and reconstruction, and they have, you know, their podcasts and their books, and there are heaven knows how many YouTube ch channels that will teach you, well, oh, I was like this, and I wanted to, ha I wanted to date, and why couldn't I date? And they were, you know, or I'm gay, or it's Trump, or it's, you know, at that point, you've got like this, like this snake inside of you, and it's, it's just awful. So, but it's a, it, but it's a really, can be quite a useful skill. That reminds me of a dorm mate I had at Pepperdine University, uh, who it was a Church of Christ school, so pretty conservative and, and religious at the time. And uh, you know, we are all you know nineteen, twenty year old men, and he's praying to get laid because he couldn't witness for God with all these distracting thoughts that you know his 
as, ah. as people do when they're 20, you know, it comes up every two minutes, right? Yeah. So <laughs> I always thought that was kind of funny. Yeah. So it's a sort of a inner voice of consciousness. Hey, I, I've thought of another example. I love it when these little coincidences happen. So today in the mail, I got my copy of Signs, which is a um, Seventh-day Adventist. Somebody put me on the mailing list just within the last few months because I just moved into this office. So I just flipped it open randomly. Here it is, The Battle for Your Thoughts. And without a doubt, only God's supernatural power can provide victory over our sinful thoughts. So yeah. to what you said here. So yeah. this guy, the author James Morgan, opens with um, uh, George Orwell's 1984, the attempts by the state to control your not just your speech and your actions, but your very thoughts. Fortunately, Orwell's predictions about 1984 proved ultra pessimistic. Such totalitarian control over our thoughts never came to pass. However, you should know that God can read our minds and he is interested in our thoughts. But unlike the leaders of Orwell's fascist fantasy land who destroyed those who are harboring wrong thoughts, God doesn't want to punish us for the evil that crosses our mind. Instead, he wants to change our thoughts and bring them into harmony with his own thoughts of compassion, mercy, and self-sacrificing love. He wants to make these changes because he knows that if the thoughts of our hearts are pure, the rest of us will be too. And they quote Proverbs 4.23, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it springs the issues of life. So is that like an, inter uh, an internal voice of conscious? Well, I mean, I think it's what you're reading is the human existential dile dilemma of consciousness. So what it is to be aware is to be aware of all of these negative, critical things, you know, and partly it's negative things that you think experience to be negative. So, you know, you, you, I mean, you, I, I, I kind of, I'm constantly giving myself commands about what to wear, what to do, or what to eat. And like, you know, and, and I didn't realize this till I, till recently. And I was like standing in front of the refrigerator door and rather than, rather than thinking, huh, what would make a healthy lunch today? I'm thinking, I don't want, don't do, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. And I think that's very human. And it's also very human to have many thoughts that you wish you didn't have, you know, whether those are, you know, the kinds of thoughts that distract young men at the age of 18, or whether they're the thoughts of, you know, failure, inadequacy, shame, which are just so common. And so you have this, you know, so we know that there are a bunch of things that are true, right? We know that there's an enormous amount of variation in the human experience of thought. We don't know enough about that because it's so hard to figure out, but it's clear that some people have lots of visual thoughts. Some people have lots of, you know, word, wordish thoughts. Some people don't have a lot of thoughts. Uh, some people have, you know, a lot of sensory thoughts. There's this thing of like, Imageless thought, or that that's like, like a real or an unsymbolized thought, thought a thought that comes to you that it's not an image, it's not words, but you know that it's got content. And there's a lot of stuff, so there's a lot of variation, um, and there is. Um, I do think that one of the one of the jobs of religion uh, is to manage that for people. You know, I think that's the job of adulthood. And the job of adulthood is to figure out how to be an effective, kind, loving, and, and generative person in ways that those negative thoughts don't get in the way. That somehow you're able to surmount those, not so pay learned, attention to them. It's a learned skill like meditation or m mindfulness. Yeah. You know, I know a lot of people that do it. They're not religious, yeah. like my friend Deepak Chopra and so on. I just can't do it. And I'm told, yeah, I try and I fail. You know, I sit there for 20 seconds and I'm, you know, oh my God, I'm so bored, <laughs> whatever. You know, but I'm told, well, you know, you got to stick with it, Sherman. You got to do it an hour, you know, half an hour no. a day, three days a week and six months down the line, you'll get it. Well, the other thing you could do is to read novels. I mean, so it's, so there are two dominant practices in the spiritual tradition. That's a little bold, but one of them is like, so mindfulness is in the Christian tradition. It is an apophatic practice. You try to still your mind, get those thoughts out. 
The other thing you can do is to focus your thoughts on something in particular. So that's the that's what the evangelicals do. That's what Ignatius of Loyola does. So part of my in my first book, my first dissertation was on middle class folks in London. That's what they were. Do- I mean, they were practicing magic. And that's what they were doing. They were just trying to, you know, corral their imagination so that their imagination sort of overrode the negative, shaming, mean, and difficult thoughts. Um, and that's a heck of a lot easier. In fact, that's the reason that this other type of prayer emerged. There's this guy called, I'm going to, I'm going to apologize. I will have a shaming thought in advance of pronouncing <laughs> his name. You know, Dionysius the Areopagite. So there was some like fifth century Christian who could not do what we now called centering prayer. And instead he created these imagination rich prayers because he said that they were more, more effective. You know, and a lot of those, you know, Mary Carruthers book on uh, the way that medieval or early modern monks thought about their minds it's full of the idea that, you know, it, it, you should be very imaginative. You should just have scripture replace the human imagination. And there's some, um, you know, monks who write about like, you know, replacing brick by brick your human memories with your ideas about scripture. Uh, it's much easier. You know, you can kind of live and back in the days when you know, now you could sort of do it with Harry Potter. But if you, you know, or, you know, with Trollope or with, with any, with anyone who's inner, who's, whose world, you know, you feel comfortable in and is wise and generative and helpful. Um, But, you know, back in, you know, back in the days when scripture was the narrative frame for most people back, I don't know, before the 17th century, before, maybe before the 19th century, you know, that. Those scriptural stories were just vividly rich, and they're so contradictory. You could weave them together in a way that's helpful. So when someone like me, again, or Richard Dawkins or Steve Pinker or Dan Dennett or any of the new atheist Christopher Hitchens and so on say, you know, this is just a bunch of bullshit. It's not true. It, it would be, would you say it would be like saying, well, Harry Potter's actually not true. Well, no one would even bring that up. I mean, well, you've missed the point. It's a story. <laughs> well, I, it is it's just a story, but um, I, I, I tend not to care about whether it's true or not. I mean, I, I was raised a Unitarian. It may have just been what I kind of ate at the breakfast table. But it's, <laughs> your par- it's, your it's, parents were Unitarians? Yeah. I mean, my, my mother was the daughter of a Baptist pastor, and my father was oh. the son of a Christian scientist, and then he went oh, wow. to medical school. I mean, so I, you know, the, the the family always went to church, but I would say that, you know, my mother always went to church and died surrounded by books on, surrounded by books by, by Sam Harris. I mean, so she just struggled with this. But to me, I don't know why, but, you, you know, I, I've never been able to really get on board with what I'll call the problem of intangible presence, you know, some kind of substance in the world that is different from all other substances. But I kind of think that going to church can be helpful for people. And it's Intan- very, Hang on. Uh, intangible presence. What do you mean by that? That's the kind of stuff that Ben writes about. Except, okay. So I am, I and Ben are really interested in what it feels like to feel the presence of God or to all this sensory stuff, which is utterly fascinating because it's so powerful and it's so weird and it really happens to people. It's not a way of talking. And so where does that come from? So the ontological claim, is it true? I've never, you know, we are temperamentally different this way. I'm not motivated to argue against it. I'm not motivated to argue for it. I tend for me, the stumbling block to belief in an ordinary Christian sense, whatever that means, 
is the idea that I'm not, it's hard for me to get around the idea that there is a mind in the next room talking to me. It's a little easier to get around the the idea that, you know, maybe there's this kind of pulsating universe that I don't understand. So the extended mind, I, you know, I have a little more room for that. But what, but, but in some sense, it doesn't really matter to me. What I find myself quite compelled by is, you know, why do some people have these inner demons? Why do some people have outer demons? What's the difference between that and madness? How do we, how would we know? When is it helpful? Um, that kind of thing. What, what is sleep paralysis? How many people have it? Yeah. When is it, ex- when is it ecstatic and when is it demonic? How does that happen? You know, what is, is like, like one of the things we, I think I discovered, other people have known this, but for me it was a discovery. Some people have the sense that God or a demon or, who, or whoever is like in the room with them and they know exactly where that God is sitting, but they don't smell God or hear God or see God. But they know. What's that about? How many people have that experience? You know, and is it how much does um does language matter? So I, you know, it's it's um you you know in different cultural worlds or different theological worlds where people use different languages to describe their experiences are these really different experiences are they all you know the same experience? I, I think they're very similar like the sleep paralysis is our yeah. go-to explanation for alien abduction experiences yeah and, but but if you read the narratives of centuries ago they weren't aliens they were incubi and succubi because they lived in a demon haunted world but we're not really a demon haunted world anymore we're more into aliens right so yeah. the but the so the culture tells you how to interpret these uh, anomalous psychological experiences uh, right. and, and so forth. Yeah, uh, and I've often thought that the the there's one more underlying level, and that is, I am not alone in the universe. There is something else out there, call them aliens or gods or whatever, uh, and maybe that's a kind of one of the driving factors there. So. One of the questions is how many kinds of anomalous experiences are there? Um, and what explains, are there genuine differences in, you know, are there, is there really more sleep paralysis in Southeast Asia than there is in the U.S.? A lot of data suggests that. Um, is, you know, how do we think about that? And then there's this deep puzzle of, when somebody feels called, when can, when when should you trust that? That's the question that people write to me about. You know, so you know, I, I, I you know, when should you trust it? When, when is it crazy? And of course, that's unanswered. So the unanswerable question is, what, when is it God? Right. That's I don't go there, and I don't go there for two reasons. First of all, something can be quite crazy and still be God. If you believe in God, I mean, Ezekiel kind of looks like he was pretty far out there on the, you know, if you were, um, I mean, Ezekiel, one of the biblical prophets, you know, there, there, there are scholars who say that he represents, has the behavior of somebody with schizophrenia. Um, but he's clearly also meant to be a vehicle for God. So um, I also don't think it's my... I, I I just am not comfortable saying this is God. But but, but the subjects of your study are not the uh, you know the schizophrenics, the people that are hallucinating, the Joan of Arc or or any of these like Ezekiel. Sometimes Maybe they're they having ep- epileptic seizures or whatever. But the average person, you know, no, just the average, average Christian American that just goes to church on Sunday and you know that yeah I believe in God and so on. Yeah. You know, and and when they so when they say you know I prayed or I heard the voice of God or whatever, they're not they're not hallucinating like a psychotic in, oh, in a, in a ward. Sure they are. Yeah. So one of the deep scientific questions is, so first of all, sometimes they do have auditory experiences of God. Many people who are psychotic have non auditory experiences of God. So one of the deep scientific questions that I've been involved with alongside Ben, uh, 
Alderson Day um, has been our, when people, ordinary folks who go to church and they have these vivid experiences, which aren't so common, but they, you know, people, you know, they have the experience. This is, this is an experience somebody shared with me. She started going back to church after a long time. She wasn't sure that she was doing the right thing. She um, She's sitting in her kitchen. She's a little torn. She says, says to the ceiling, Jesus, are you real? And she hears quite distinctly, and maybe I'm, I'm I, maybe I'm paraphrasing, but she, but what I remember her to say quite distinctly is, "Yes, I am." So she has, and this is not uncommon. Roughly a third of the people in these churches have some auditory or near auditory experience. So for me, one of the deep questions is, in fact. What's the relationship between what I'll call psychosis, which is the kind of thing that we think about with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, different kinds, the, the kinds of the terrible mental illnesses. What's the relationship between that and what I'll call imagination? Mm, the capacity right. to be caught up in your imagination and have that imagination become so vivid. Oh, that you call somehow, that absorption, right? Yeah. So when I give people a something called the absorption scale, and to use the science word, I that the way they respond to these questions reports, or report, it predicts whether they have vivid sensory experiences of spirit. Is that because they have a little bit of psychosis? Well, I don't think so, but it turns out that it's not trivial to make that case. And of course, one of the reasons it's not trivial is that many people who have psychosis are very imaginative. And, you know, it's all oh, psychosis kind of runs, you know, one little challenge channels in many of us. But so, but so I still, so I think there's a difference. And one of the questions is, you know, all these kinds of vivid experiences, you know, how do we, how do they cluster together? How, uh, sleep paralysis is probably the clearest of these experiences. Sleep paralysis, you can recognize sleep paralysis in the witch trials. It's just like, it's there. And, and presence is much murkier. So because people mean so many things by presence, um, voice or, you know, I heard, I saw. If you've got an anthropologist talking to that person, the anthropologist can find out how auditory or how visual it was, you know, but it's, it's, anyway. Yeah, ben, ben talked about, about a, a lot of different ones. Yeah. A sense presence uh, often in extreme environments. So, uh, you know, the, the alpinists, solo sailors, the dog sled mushers in the Iditarod, uh, right. My own experience in the race across America, these, you know, long distance solo uh, cyclists and long distance runners. And so it's not just altitude because solo sailors have it, right? So, but there's something about being alone for a long time and threatened, like it's it, it's dark or the sea is dark or, or you can't quite make out what's going on. There's some threat to your bodily safety. And this is when the presence comes in and kind of gives you guidance. He has these accounts where, you know, these climbers are, the, the person, the presence is right there on the ropes with them, you know, kind of giving them, here's what you should do next. Okay. It's just an internal dialogue in their head, but, but it's, it's providing some useful information for survival. And you don't need, I mean, so that those are the classic third man experiences. Yeah. So called because of Shackleton traipsing across the plains of Georgia, South <laughs> Georgia. Um, but, and I've always thought that some of those experiences could be explained by, the 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 way light looks so different on the mountains or in the water or on the snow. Uh, there's something about the body's awareness of itself. I've always thought that that was played some role. But I have also talked to people who, you know, they're driving down the highway and God says, move to the right. And, you know, and then this car goes speeding by to the left. Now, that's not the third man. But it's something about this moment of extremis where 
you could call it God, you could call it, you know, your own survival instinct. There's something often the advice is at least the, the stories that are we hear are good ones because they survived. We don't know. I mean, it's always possible that some people gave themselves terrible advice and then we don't hear about it. But those, so those are a kind of experience. Near death experiences are another. You know, probably neurons are dying later than the rest of the body, but there's, there's, there's this thing that happens. Um, hallucinations. Pretty, pretty sure that's, it's pretty sure that that's universal. Uh, and pro, and what, in our work, we think that there are patterns so that hearing and seeing is always more common than smelling and tasting. Uh, touch is a little messy. Um, but trying to figure out, so I, so I think that a lot of hallucinations in effect are made out of thought, that they're experiences of consciousness that we have. And what they really teach us is that there are inner worlds have texture. We don't think of our, our thoughts as having texture, but they do. Like some thoughts are louder than other thoughts or, or more spontaneous or they more commanding. And somehow there's something about the way that we relate to those thoughts that changes them. So some of them feel like they're more outside of us. I think one thing I'm after here, Tanya, is that um, some atheists think, well, if you believe in God and you're praying to God and you're hearing voices, you're just psychotic. You're just crazy. And I'm trying to say, well, that, that's not possible that 150 million Americans are, are psychotic. It's just not possible. Much like I had a guest on here uh, talking about uh, cults. He's one of the leading, world's leading cult experts, and he wrote a book on the, tr the cult of Trump. And, you know, so he and I disagreed on this, you know, like you can't possibly say that 74 million Americans who voted for Trump are all in a cult that are brainwashed. Come on. People believe for different reasons. Right. So in this case, you know, like white evangelicals, why would they vote for Trump? One of the least evangelical moral Christian people ever. Well, because it's not that's a different kind of belief. They're, you know, they're they're going for po political. You know, he's going to get us the judges we need to overturn Roe v. Wade's doing this tighten the borders, whatever, it has nothing to do with God and, and religion. They're not brainwashed or whatever. There's some other explanation for the belief. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so one, I, I'm deeply interested in that question. And so some of my colleagues think that, in fact, uh, when the millions of people who claim to hear God speak to them have a sort of low-level psychosis, so I think that that's, and that's, it's not an unreasonable, it's a very politically exciting idea because it suggests that if we just treated people with psychosis differently, they could, you know, they could learn from us, we, you know, they'd be better. But I think that it's, there's something, here's the really interesting question. Sometimes when uh, people have these vivid imaginative experiences, or often, there's a different quality to the to the experience. It's more narratively rich, and it feels different from some of the experiences people with psychosis describe. Um, and again, I don't really know what what I mean. It doesn't really matter with some or whether somebody has a little psychosis or not. I, I don't know. But it's it, when I try to fret about. Um, how to explain the quality of the experience. I really want to say there's something basic about the way that humans relate to their thoughts. And this gets tweaked in psychosis. It's like, a, it's like it gets tweaked and goes negative in psychosis. But that, that's what's basic about human. I, I, so here's what I think is so cool. I think that humans like we kind of feel like we own our thoughts, but we don't, right? Our thoughts often behave like rebellious teenagers. They're just bubbling up from underneath. They're just bubbling up <laughs> and they just do that and we can't control them. And so I think there's something about the way that we relate to them that leads some of them to kind of feel like they come from someone else. And there is a story to tell about what kind of ideas you might have about the mind that would make that, that more or less powerful. 
Um, there's a story to tell about what kind of person you are, whether the person gets absorbed in your imaginative worlds. But there's something about the way we relate to our thoughts that makes them feel like they're not ours. And when that happens, they can feel, they powerfully affect the way we manage ourselves. And if you get it right, it's incredibly useful. And if you get it wrong, it's not so useful. Mm. Well, there are cognitive psychologists who argue the self is it is an illusion. There is no self. You, you just tell a story about your past and your current memories and so on that is relatively coherent, but it, it, it could be some other story and you'd believe it just the same. There's a lot of randomness there. A lot of psychologists who believe in determinism and not compatibilism or free... You know, your thoughts just come from who knows where, um, and you do not have the control you think you have. Right. Free will is an illusion. Right. So this is all, this is like the hard problem, right? The yeah. hard problem of consciousness. And when I, yeah. What I can contribute is that I think that people have all these feelings. Their thought feels a certain way to them. They have experiences of their thought, and they, and by the way they there's a lot of cultural stuff that's shaping that experience. And there's a lot of practices that shape that experience. But it's in and the management you can have over your own thoughts is actually pretty pathetic. Anyone who's been in psychotherapy for some years knows that. <laughs> you pay a vast, you know, it's it <laughs> but you have some. And that's just so interesting. That, you know, it's not only that we're conscious but that we are managers of our own awareness and that manages our behavior. A little bit like the self-help movement. I've been rethinking this. You know, we used to be fairly skeptical of it. And I talk about um, uh, one of my uh, uh, authors of, uh, for the article on the skeptic on the self-help actualization movement, Sham, he called it, uh, Steve Salerno worked for Rodale Press in their self-help books uh, department. And he said the number one predictor of anybody that would buy a self-help book is people that have already bought self-help books. Uh -huh. right. If that really worked, why do you have to keep buying them? And why do right. you have to keep having the tapes and the posters and the little reminders? And But now, you know, I think about this, really every day is a new day. And there's, uh, you know, a hundred things that could go wrong today. And, and, and so I'd really need to kind of re-up every morning all right, get up, make your bed, clean your room, eat breakfast, work out, do this, you have a routine. And humans, being flawed, need reminders of that. So that kind of ritualistic method, and maybe this gets into religious rituals, is is, is something that needs to be repeated regularly. So why do people go to church every Sunday? Well, because you got to re-up every day. Well, also, I think there's something really powerful about saying to yourself that the world is good and you're grateful for being in it. And that's at the heart of any religious practice. And it's the heart of any self-help practice. You know, the world is good, I am an effective person, and I can be good in the world. And that kind of, I mean, when you think about it, it's really sort of ridiculous. That, <laughs> like Al Frank and Stuart Smalley. <laughs> and and doggone it, people like me. <laughs> and doggone it, people like me. I mean, you know, it really is that. That is the basic impulse. You know, that's what people say in church again and again and again. You know, God loves me and the world is good, even with all the evidence to the contrary. Yeah. And that gives people hope. That's a good thing. Yeah. Well, it's one of the criticisms of social media and the algorithms, how they work. They just feed you all the bad stuff. Yeah. And so it really does take some effort to, you know, not think the world's a pretty bad place. Right. Right. Yeah, I'm not sold that social media has been a net plus for the world. But <laughs> right. There it is. <laughs> well, okay. We have it. We have it nevertheless, and I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Where do you think your own skepticism comes from? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question because I, I was a believer in in God and all that stuff. I told you I went to Pepperdine. I was born again Christian for about seven years, but that was a high school, very youthful. You know, 1971, high school, friends were doing it. So, you know, a co sort of peer group influence, not parental because my parents weren't religious. Um, and, but I got into it, you know, I went to, to these Bible study classes, this was seventies, right? So, you know, lots of guitar playing and, and that sort of thing, very social. 
Uh, but then when I went to Pepperdine, I thought, I'm going to really study this stuff, you know, taking classes in the Old Testament, New Testament, the life of Jesus. We read, <laughs> did, of course, in C.S. Lewis, I read, I read, I read, yeah, it was a little, well, it was kind of in, overly intellectualized for me. So I didn't get the whole emotional thing. We, I read everything C.S. Lewis wrote and all that stuff. And, you know, then, then I went to graduate school in experimental psych and, you know, and then I took some courses for fun on uh, anthropology. Um, this uh, anthropologist, Marlene de, de, de Rios was her name, and she had married a one of these shamans from South yeah, America. I know the and book. Wrote a, yeah, wrote about all these experiences. And I thought, you know, how do I know I got it right? <laughs> you know, these other people, they, all over the world, I started and you know, did my, went through my Joseph Campbell stage. And all right, so, you know, this these are stories, they're myths, they're not really true. And in science, we want to know what's actually true. You know, the ontological question matters, right? So, um, so that shifted me toward skepticism. I was also open to the paranormal, the supernatural, Uri Geller, all that stuff. You know, and uh, in the 70s, Thelma Moss had that lab at UCLA on Curlian photography and hypnosis and altered states of consciousness and uh, out-of-body experience. I thought there maybe there's something to it, right? But then skeptic scientists, you know, it's like, oh, no, no, no. Here's what's actually going on in the mind or whatever. It's like, okay. So I, I have kind of cited with that, I'm not as neutral as you are um, because part of my day job is to actually comment. Well, is it true or not, right? <laughs> like the the resurrection, you know, so Sunday was Easter. I posted my article, how to think about the resurrection in a Bayesian way. You know, it's very, very, very unlikely that it actually happened, that this guy named Jesus was actually killed and three days later came back to life. And then a lot of people, oh, come on, Trevor, it's not literally true. It's a mythic truth. It's in a different category. Okay, but then I see in the New York Times, N.T. Wright has a, you know, major uh, interview say, no, no, it actually happened. And if it didn't happen, you shouldn't be a Christian, right? It's like, wow, all right. <laughs> so he's putting it back in the realm of it's an empirical truth it, because if I didn't believe it was actually true, then I would I'd be a Jew or whatever. You know, it is true, I think, that um, this, you know, I've, so, I've sometimes thought that if, if, you know, one commits to the truth, knowing that it's sort of absurd, um, the religion is more effective. I mean, I think that it's, um, it's like this business about Jesus showing up at the foot of the bed. Mm, it's, right. um, I do think that if you are able to really, you know, even taken as an, as an identity marker that, you know, it, it really happened, um, in the face of all the evidence, it can be much more satisfying. And it's, and that's very, do you think that's because we live in the age of science? We're post enlightenment, uh, descendants of the scientific revolution and so on. And therefore believers feel like they need to make an argument. Like it's actually true. Not just, this is my beliefs and you have your beliefs and there's no way to know for sure. Well, I think the existential struggle is trying, is, you know, so the way I think about it, there's always this faith frame and an everyday frame. And it is because there's so much of the faith frame that isn't true, like, you know, a lot of terrible things, you know, there was just another shooting. I mean, terrible things happen in the world. The world is not unfolding the way a benevolent and omnipotent uh, omniscient God would allow. And and everybody knows that, right? It's, it's, it's not news. And so to hold on to that promise of joy, I think it can be a lot easier to kind of overcommit and make those, you know, to do that Kierkegaardian thing of making the incomprehensible what you're going to commit to. And then that can sort of drag you along. And, and then I think that people... So I think this is one of the deep things we don't know enough about. I think that people are pretty good at managing conflicting epistemic frames. And again, it's like not, I mean, nobody really believes, you know, people who lose their parents don't really believe that their inner mother or father is yelling at them, right? That, that they're, they're, even if their parents are alive, they're, I mean, it, that this is ridiculous. But people still feel that. And so, you know, people are, are always kind of struggling with these conflicting commitments. And I think it can help people manage their commitment to the idea of being loved if they kind of insist that there's a realness to the, to the claim. Mm. And it's sort of... Sometimes I wonder, 
you know, we're all products of our worldview in our time. If somebody, say, a 15th century pre-Copernican believer in God and so on, Christian, say, would they even be asking these questions and having a conversation like this? No, I, in fact, that's, um, you know, there's that claim, Lefebvre maybe, that there was no atheism prior to the, the Enlightenment. I think that that's not true. I mean, I think that um, anthropologists, you know, not not all anthropologists. I don't think everybody is as observant as I would want them to be. But if you get an anthropologist talking to people who are not literate, and not hooked into social media, and not well, these are mostly anthropologists studying different worlds, there plen there's plenty of doubt. I think the doubt is actually pretty inherent to claims about invisible beings. I think it's harder to doubt them when the invisible beings do not have much power and they're kind of mean, right? Because if somebody tells you, like, don't go into that into that wood, there's a, there's a sprite that will, you know, there's a troll there. It's easy to avoid the the, the wood. It's harder to accept to really believe in your heart that um that god god loves you for who you are you know no matter what people tell you i think it's kind of hard right and, so that maybe that's where the self help you know daily reminders or weekly meetings yeah. comes into play wasn't it uh, mother teresa at the end of her life and somebody after she died found her diary saying she had severe doubts about everything i was like wow mother teresa <laughs> i think that's actually extremely common I'm really struck by the fact that when I, I, I mean, I'm, I, people would say outraged things in response, but um, there's a lot of verbal commitment, but how many Christians feel all the time that they are loved by Jesus? Uh, I think that's hard. I think some people do. You have to work pretty hard to get there, but, and, and people try to do that try to do that. They make themselves guilty all the time because they're not doing it enough. And I th like self-help books, I, mean, I think that, that you can do it a little bit a lot of the time. But to really get there, it's, it's hard. Which is why these amazing spiritual experiences are so great for people when they happen. Mm. Is that what you mean by kindling? The little twigs that burn every day to keep the fire going? Yeah. You just pay attention in different ways to different things and you... You get a richer sense that there there really is a God that's paying attention to you, and the way the way that you're looking, the way you're paying, the, the way you the things you say, your everyday habits can help God to feel more real. Is there research on how people convert to religion versus when they leave religion? You know, like how long mm -hmm. it takes, or the kinds of experiences that lead them to find God or to give up God or religion. It's a great question. Um, there is research on conversion. There's a big fat book on my bookshelf written by somebody. <laughs> um, it's, um, you know, William James said that uh, all spontaneous conversions, in fact, have a long pre-life. That there's this kind of, un, you know, and um, I, I knew a woman who studied Moonies, who said that she could always tell who was going to convert. She would watch these people come in off the street and like listen, they'd have dinner and then, then listen to the talk. And she said, the person who's more likely to convert is the person who's angry. Yeah. Yeah. So the person who's emotionally, so you should be aware. Well, you often, hear, you often hear <laughs> the conversion stories, you know, the person's down and out, drugs, sex, drugs, rock and roll, everything. They lost their families and, and livelihood and so on, they found, found God and that turned their lives around. You know, that. so on, on the one hand, that's good. It's good to, to, to turn your life around and so on. Um, but why do people leave? It's, uh, I mean, is there research on this that, you know, it isn't one thing? I mean, there's stuff on the, you know, Jews became atheists after the Holocaust, understandably. Uh, but what about other people? A really good question. Um, I'm sure that there is... I had a student who was trying to ask that question and disappeared. Um, I think there are, there's certainly a story about people who become atheists because of their logical 
questions, the kind of story that you're telling often. This is a young person's story um, that, uh, you know, you come to that Piagetian age of kind of logical analysis Mm -hmm. and, you know, the logic just doesn't add up and you take off. Um, And I went through a version of that myself. You did? Um, Yeah. Yeah. Tell us about that. Oh, well, I was I was in in high school, and I was um, kind of the famous atheist in my high school. You were. <laughs> I was, um, because I, you know, I really struggled with human pain and this commitment to um, a, you know, I, I the Odyssey just didn't do it for me. It's I, I, I didn't see how that this claim of a benevolent, omnipotent. A nation god was going to work. It is true that um, I was quite struck in my thirties. I had two friends who had uh, sons who were very, very ill, and before we knew how that story was going to come out, one of my friends said to me, "Well, this has led me to understand that there can't be a god. I'd be offended by the idea that God had done this to my child." And my other friend said, I couldn't get through this without God. And I was quite struck by that. Um, And there is this kind of cliche that people leave faith in as young adults because because it doesn't make sense. And they come back in some way in middle age for the same reason. And I've always found that moving. Right. Well, that's what happened to me. I mean, my conversion to Christianity was, you know, overnight just with a, a friend. And, you know, I went to the to the Glendale Presbyterian Church. And at the end of the sermon, which was very inspirational, and I'm there with my buddy and his family, uh, the, the the preacher call, call, did the calling come forward to be born again. You know, the, the, and I'm all right. So I got up and my buddy's like, oh, my God, you're doing it. I'm, I'm doing it. <laughs> right. And then uh, so I did it. And then the next day at school, I told my friend Frank, who had been working on me to be religious, too. Uh, you know, I, I did it. I, I, I was born again. And, and uh, he goes, well, where did you do this? Like, the Presbyterian Church in Glendale. He goes, no, no, that's the wrong one. I'm like, what? It turns out he was a Jehovah Witness, and I didn't know anything about the difference between any of these religions. Like, the wrong one? Okay. That always stuck in the back of my mind. But my deconversion was very slow. I mean, I told you, you know, graduate school, taking courses in anthropology and so on and so forth. And then I just, I had a little ichthus, the little fish, you know, and and this is at 70, so guys wore these gold chains. Pretty obnoxious. Anyway, my girlfriend had given it to me, uh, and so I just took it off because it was like, you know, I just don't feel right wearing this thing i don't really believe this anymore and i quit witnessing to people i think my family was actually believed (laughs) i quit bringing up jesus every family dinner and so on uh and that was it i mean it wasn't a big deal because i was at a secular state university so it didn't matter it wasn't at pepperdine and no one cared and i realized well these people are all good people and i don't know it's like what difference is it? I don't have to be religious or not religious. And this was before the whole atheism, science and religion battles and all that stuff. No one really cared. Didn't really matter. So there was no cost to me. But like my friend who wrote that letter, and, or, and I get letters like this all the time, I don't believe, but everybody I know does. Everybody at work goes, you know, the only question is, which church are you going to this Sunday? Right? Which Christian church? And I feel bad for those people, right? They don't have a community. I mean, I, I, again, I, I'm suspecting there's more variety in the church than they imagine. Mm. Uh, and the question is, like, how to find those people. Maybe expressing mm-hmm. doubt, you'll find out other people are also doubting. Oh, that would be, that's good. Yeah. That would be a good exercise. Yes. I, I wanted to ask you just uh, just, to, just a few more questions on on religion and politics. As an anthropologist studying the American landscape, for yeah. all these decades, uh, you, you know, I, I just kind of think before the 1980s, the moral majority and all that stuff, religion was pretty private in politics and it, it wasn't a big deal. Now mm-hmm. it's a pretty big deal to the yeah. point. You know, and then you have this weird thing where, you know, 81 percent of white evangelicals voted for Trump. Why? Right. You know, and, and it, it, so maybe it's not the religious moral principle so much as the pragmatic we want to win 
our elections. We want to get our people in there so we can get what we think is best for America. Something like, what do you make of the American political religious landscape? Um, I, it's a great question. I feel like I speak less well about that than, uh, about people's experiences. I do think that, that there were particular people who made a huge difference. Francis Schaeffer was one of them, who was sort of a guy in the early 70s who, in effect, dis- you could make the argument that he made a conscious choice to turn the post-Roe generation into Republicans, um, and it could have gone differently. A lot of the kids in, this, in the 60s who were you know those 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 hippie Christians. A lot of those are dem- were Democrats or apolitical, and some somebody made a decision in conjunction with the fact that many of the people who came to to pastor those kids were Pentecostal. Um, but there there were a couple of people who made a big decision. Why did why has has Trump worked so well in the modern world? Um. I think some of it, again, are clever politicians. Uh, I think part of the story is that evangelicals have often felt, um, you know, it's it part of the, the sort of life stream of conservative Christianity to feel that America is not paying attention, that we are shamed and embarrassed, and that had a very effective consonance with white lower middle class folks who felt left out of the American dream, the kind of people that Arlie Hochstrals describes that, you know, felt like they were kicked to the back of the line by all these black and brown people who got in front of them. Um, it's as she she tells this in like Strangers in Their Own Land. It's a great book. Um I think there's that's part of it. I think that um there is a lot of room in, in the, the weirdness of a world that takes revelations seriously to think of weird people as being useful. So the idea of, you know, David was a model for Trump and a lot of that election rhetoric. David, a flawed king. Trump was a little more flawed even than David, but he certainly fit, fit that mold. Um, and I do think that if you were um, being rational, perfectly reasonable and rational, the Supreme Court was a pretty good reason to put a clothespin over your nose and vote. So, and then somehow it gets hooked up into these identity claims and... Um, I don't think that the Christians bear all the responsibility for the dysfunction of the Republican Party, as I would see it in Congress now. We get um, this bundling of flag and faith. Yes. And it is, and so part of it is some savvy politicians who thought that if they made that happen, it would work, serve them well, which is true. And this long-standing sense of embarrassment about um, committed Christian or conservative Christian conviction. I look. I'm. I'm. I. I you know. You. I, I think the Scopes trial is playing a role here. It's um, that there's there's something that that was a decades-long brewing. So when Fuller Theological Seminary decides that their people should go mainstream in the 50s, Scopes is in the background. They are not, they've decided they're not going to be sneered at again. And there is a language of being sneered at that is still extremely powerful in these churches. And I think that's, and that, again, it's a nice confluence with the sense of being abandoned by these coastal elites. Interesting, because I observed that in the intelligent design creationism movement in the 90s, they really threw off the old young earth creationists as a bunch of embarrassing yahoos that Mm -hmm. we don't want anything to do. We're doing real science, math, information theory, 
DNA. Forget all that flood geology stuff from the Bible. Don't even talk about the Bible. Just leave that out. We want to be taken seriously. Yeah. And so, and so this shame has this long genealogy. I should actually take off, but... Oh, it's time to go. Okay. <laughs> but it's really right. good to talk. I really oh, no, enjoyed it was, this. It, it, it was great. Yeah, well, uh, so what are you, what, what's your next project? What are you working on? Voices. Oh, trying, okay. Trying to explain these experiences. Oh, nice. Trying to cut the, connect them to the experience of awareness, the phenomenology of awareness, as it were. But basically, madness and, and spirituality. Oh, Are they the same? Are they different? Right. How would you right. know? And does right. it matter? <laughs> It reminds right. me of that book, The Three Christs of Ypsilanti, yes. where that psychiatrist love brought that. in three people, each of who thought he was Jesus. Yeah, yeah. real <laughs> I love that study. It yeah. was just great. <laughs> it's too funny. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Tanya. That's really appreciate talk. your work. Again, the book is How God Becomes Real. Great read. Very interesting. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much.